Hello again and welcome to the second English Today Business DVD. In this DVD, you can watch another five episodes of our story on the job, followed by the business skills section, giving a presentation. Then we'll look at the following. Talking about a crisis at work. Talking on the phone. Describing real or unlikely events. Agreeing and disagreeing. And finally, asking for clarification. Thank you, and enjoy yourselves. So, Anne, how did your meeting with Mr. Stevens and the Montex representative go? Quite, quite well. Actually, it was very interesting. Did they come to any agreement? Well, for the moment, Montrax is going to print 3,000 copies of our next series of cookbooks. Mr. Stevens wants to give them a, a trial run and, and see how they work. If they meet their deadlines and price competitively, he'll sign on for, for larger deals in the future. Well, we're hoping to optimize our work and to drive down costs a little. And the publishing market is in a deep crisis. Readership is dropping rapidly, which is driving down sales. At the same time, production costs are increasing because of foreign rights acquisition as well as distribution costs. As a matter of fact, I, I haven't bought many books recently. Tell me, Rachel, does this crisis also affect us here at Pilgrim? Certainly. The negative trends of the market are felt throughout the sector, beginning with those who work in it. In any case, I'm optimistic, and I'm sure this is just a passing crisis, and that the publishing sector will soon recover. That's probably what, what Gary wanted to talk to me about this morning. I saw him, and... He said that he had something very important to tell me. Uh-huh. What? Why are you making that face? <laughs> no, it's, it's nothing, Anne. It's just that. It's just that... I don't trust Gary. He's a Latin lover and full of himself. <laughs> he chases all of the pretty girls around here, and you are just his latest victim. <laughs> Look, Rachel, I'm perfectly capable of looking after myself. I only have a working relationship with Gary, and that's how it's going to stay. Sorry, Anne. I, I certainly didn't mean to offend you. I'm quite aware that you are an intelligent young woman who can keep men like Gary at a distance. In any case, I just wanted to warn you. I'm sure you'll agree with me once you get to know him. Yes, uh, to be honest, I am a bit worried. Profits are down 8% over the last few months. Oh. And just yesterday, uh, I read an article in, uh, in, in Media World that confirmed my suspicions. Forecasts for the publishing market are, are quite pessimistic. And the general feeling is that things are going to continue to go downhill based on current trends. The next five years could see a further drop of 20%. If we leave out bestsellers and fiction, then the entire publishing market has taken a direct hit. Or, better, is in a downward spiral. But what about sales? For the moment, they're stationary, but we won't be able to improve them. In fact, we'll have to stop publication of our encyclopedias of history and art history with awful consequences for those working on these projects. Are you saying that we'll have to lay people off? No, no, not for the moment. But if things continue like they are, 
we will have to let some of our people go. Oh, my God. There must be something we can do to keep from cutting staff. I'm meeting with uh, Mr. Stevens this afternoon to mm. discuss the situation. We're going to focus on uh, new objectives for the company in both marketing and sales. Perhaps we will develop uh, a new line of economic paperbacks, which might help sales. But the other publishers are already doing that successfully. I think we'll need to develop new products to encourage new market opportunities. Well said, Billy. Uh, I've already got an idea to suggest. It won't resolve all of our problems, but it could bring about some interesting developments. And what might this new idea be? Anne! Well... Anne, are you in there? Hey, you! I'm looking for my friend Anne. Is she with you? <gasps> Anne! Surprise! Uh, Anne, hello. Come back to Earth. Uh, Someone's looking for you. Anne! <laughs> Alice! Uh, what are you doing here? Well, I came to see where you work, Anne. Could you give me a tour? So, these are your colleagues. Oh. <laughs> mm. What long faces. Are uh, you always like this? We need a little fun to lighten things up in here. Why don't you invite them to the party this evening? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 really. <laughs> I don't think... Well, today's really not a good time to be talking about parties. Mm? Why don't you come back some other time? And perhaps... Warn me in advance, perhaps. <laughs> bye bye, Alice. So there you heard them talking about the crisis that the company is going through, and unfortunately, that happens often when there's an economic crisis in the country. So let's look at the language that we use to describe a period of crisis in a company and let's use the screen to help us. So what usually happens is that there's a bad forecast, the future doesn't look good and there are negative trends, negative tendencies. So what happens? Things start going downhill we say. A hill is like a small mountain. Things start going downhill. And then the company goes through a period of crisis. Then, if it's really bad, we talk about the company being in deep crisis. That's the worst situation to be in. But if it's not so bad, it's just temporary, we can talk about a passing crisis, a passing crisis. And then when things get better again, we usually say to recover from a crisis. Now, a crisis can actually have quite an effect on employment. And now I want to look at the language that we use in English to describe employment. It's very interesting because we have many different words to describe that, and maybe in your languages too. So, let's look at the screen. Think of an employee. When an employee goes into a company for the first time, we say in English that he or she joins the company. Now, when they decide to go, they leave the company or they resign. We say they resign, that's because they don't want to work anymore. There, the pronunciation resign. Now, if they reach a certain age, they retire. Retire. If they decide to retire before the age of 65 or 60, we say to take early retirement, early retirement. So those are the words which are usually related to the employees. But what about the companies? Well, companies, when they take people, companies recruit, that's difficult to pronounce, recruit, companies recruit employees Another word is hire, to hire. Another verb is to take on. Now the opposite is when they send people away, we say companies sack, which is a strange word, isn't it? Sack people, they fire people. And in fact, as I said before, in English we use hiring and firing as the term for employment. So they sack 
they fire, they dismiss people, they let go, they let people go, they cut staff or they lay off. That's another term that we use, lay off. So you can see there are many, many different terms that we use for employment description. Good. Well, that's the language of crisis and the language of employment. So that's all for now and I'll see you again in the next lessons for more Business English. Uh, right. Uh, Anne, are you ready for your next telephone call? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradford. He's a great author who has worked with us for years. He's, um, he's quite friendly and uh, he's quite a wizard at the stove. He opened a restaurant a few years ago, but he sold it to move on to writing cookbooks. He knows a thousand tricks in the kitchen and he can make anything taste great. Even tomato soup. Mm, oh, come on, stop it, Gary. I've only had half a sandwich today, and hearing about tasty treats is, is driving me crazy. I know, I know. Speaking of eating, when are we going to have dinner together? You don't know when to quit, do you? L enough joking around. Um, but let me give the kitchen superman a call. Okay, okay, but uh, don't forget to pay him compliments. This guy just eats them up. Hello, good morning. This is Anne Baxter from Pilgrim Publishing. Uh, please may I speak to Mr. Bradford? Oh, Mrs. Bradford, hello. I've heard a lot about your husband. He's quite the chef, isn't he? <laughs> yes, yes, I also enjoy cooking, but uh, I'm not in the same league, of course. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, calling to propose a new cookbook series to Mr. Bradford. We're going to be taking it to press soon. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, I'll hold. Good morning, Mr. Bradford. Hello, this is Anne Baxter from Pilgrim Publishing. First of all, congratulations. You're a legend around here. But as I was telling your wife, I'm calling to see if you're interested in participating in a new cookbook series that w Yes. Yes, I know that you've always spoken to Gary Reynolds, but, but I'm the new colleague who's been assigned to this project. I beg your pardon? Well, excuse me, Mr. Bradford, but I don't understand why you consider Mr. Reynolds to be more competent than myself. In any case, if you'd like to speak to him, hold on a moment. I'll put you through. Hey, Mark. How are you? Yeah, I think you upset Anne, our new intern. Oh, she's a fantastic colleague, diligent and uh, hardworking. Yeah, let's set up a meeting so you can meet her. You'll be very impressed. <laughs> she's also a great cook. <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, I'll send you a detailed outline of the project. Okay, and we'll see each other Tuesday at 10. Okay, right. Bye, Mark. Well, what a pleasant person he is. Oh, come on, Anne. Don't let him get to you. Mr. Bradford is just a little shy with those he doesn't know. But uh, you'll see. He's quite a lot of fun once you've met him. Um, why don't we take a short break? How about a little fun on the telephone? I need to relax and have a good laugh. Okay. But uh, who should we call? I know. Let's call my flatmate Alice. She's always looking for new boyfriends, and you could pretend to be a friend of Jack's, the other flatmate. 
saying that you saw a picture of her and that you'd love to meet her. Okay, but, but she isn't going to get angry with me, is she? Oh, no, we'll tell her it was just a joke. Uh, uh, hello? Uh, uh, is that Alice? <laughs> it, this is Gary. <laughs> and uh, I'm calling because... Uh, well, I'm a little shy. And uh, I'm a friend of Jack's, and yesterday he, he showed me a picture of you. And, well, <laughs> I think you're pretty cute. <laughs> hello? Could you speak up? The line is terrible. Uh, yes, uh, I'm also having problems. Uh, this line must be congested. Uh, my name is Gary, and I'd like to get to know you a little better. What? Who are you? Uh, I'm a, a friend of Jack's, and, and yesterday I saw... A picture of you. How could that be? What picture? Don't raise your voice with me, Alice. In the picture, there were three people. One was Jack. One was an ugly girl. And then a very beautiful lady, and... Jack told me it was you. Uh, uh hold on, uh, while I put you through to a friend of mine who doesn't agree with me about the ugly girl. <clears throat> Hello? Who's speaking? This is Alice, and I urgently need to speak with the other guy. I think his name is Gary? Uh, I'm afraid I can't hear you. Could you speak up? I said I urgently need to speak with Gary. Oh, I'm afraid Gary's very busy at the moment. If you'd like an appointment, I, I can fit you in the beginning of next month. What? You are joking, aren't you? I told you I need to speak with him immediately. Alice! It's Anne! <laughs> it's a joke! And you fell for it completely. Anne, you scared the hell out of me. What a stupid joke. Okay, maybe it was a stupid joke, but you bought it hook, line and sinker. <laughs> So now let's study some of the language that you need on the telephone at work. But first, some basic vocabulary related to phones. Now, what's this? This in English is called a land phone, okay? A land phone. But this one here, which you detach, is called a cordless or a portable, all right? Cordless. Now, this instrument here is called the receiver. And this action is picking up, to pick up the receiver. Then we, two, four, seven, five, six, seven, 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 dial the number or digit the number, all right? Then we put the receiver down. We put the receiver down, or another verb that we use in English is to hang up. And that's more familiar, but it's very popular, to hang up. This type of phone, what do we call it? It's a mobile or even a cell. And in Germany, they actually call it a handy because you can hold it in your hand. So, a mobile. Now, these phones work on batteries, so you need these to keep them running. This is a battery recharger, a recharger, all right? Sometimes you don't want to listen to the speaker on the phone with it by your ear, so you can use these. These are earphones or headphones, all right? Sometimes you need to know the number of somebody so you can look in this book which is called a telephone directory. Telephone directory. And if you want special services you can use a book called the Yellow Pages. All right, so that's some of the basic language related to telephones. Now, we want to learn some phrases which are useful for you when you start a telephone conversation. And yet, let's now use the screen, which will help you understand and use that language. The first thing you do is you answer. 
So, what do we say when we answer? Well, we can say this. Hello, Pilgrim Publishing House. This is Louise. Can I help you? All right. So, look at the screen. You say the name of the company. This is Pilgrim Publishing House. Your name. This is Louise. How can I help you? Or, can I help you? Notice I said, this is Louise, not I am Louise, because this is, is the language we use on the telephone in English. So, this is, not I am. So, you introduce yourself. You say, hello, this is Jane Holmes, for example. Notice again, I say, this is, you don't say I am. Now, if the other person doesn't know you, you can say, I was given your name by Mr. Smith, for example, all right? I was given your name by Mr. Smith. Great. Now, you want to speak to someone, so you ask, uh, hello, um, could I speak to, may I speak to, can I speak to, three possibilities, could may very polite can less formal so can i speak to mr james please now if he is in another office you can ask for his extension number so you can say could i have extension 573 please extension 573 another thing is you can ask to be connected and in english the verb is could you put me through to Mr. James? Could you put me through to, that means connect, Mr. James, all right? You can also say, I'd like to speak to Mr. James. There. The next thing is asking for people to wait because you have to connect. You can say, just a minute, just a moment, please. One moment, please. Hold the line, please. Hold on, please. Hang on is more informal. So, you see, there are many ways of waiting for time passing. Then, the next important thing is when you make a telephone call, sometimes you need to check that it's convenient, especially on mobile phones, because people answer when they're walking in the street, etc. So, it's good to say, is this a bad time, or am I disturbing you? You see on the screen, is this a bad time, am I disturbing you, can you talk? Because that way you know that it's convenient for you to speak to that person. That's important. And one more thing is maybe you want to leave a message. So you could say, can you take a message, please? Or can I leave a message? And then you could say, could you tell him that I called? Could you tell him I called? And a little bit more complicated, could you get him to call me back on 75396? Can you get him to call me back on and then the number? All right, that's a lot. Lots of interesting phrases, but they are all very important. So you need to learn them by heart so they're here when you pick up the phone. All right, that's the end of this lesson, but we will be doing more on telephoning later. So, bye. Hello, is this Montex typography? Good morning, this is Lewis Stevens of Pilgrim Publishing. I'd like to speak with Mr. Emerson. Oh, he's in a meeting. I see. Could you put me through to one of his children, to John or Lucy, please? Oh, they are also in a meeting. Fine, then may I speak with Mr. Richardson? You don't mean to say that he's also in a meeting. 
Yes, I see. Is there anyone that I could speak with to find out if our order has already gone to press? I'd also like some information about deliveries. Yes, I see. They're all in meetings. Could you take a message for Mr. Emerson? Ask him to call me as soon as possible, ASAP. I'll be in my office until 4. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, they certainly do like meetings at Montex, don't they? Good morning. Uh, this is Gary Reynolds of Pilgrim Publishing. I would like to speak with Mr. Smith, please. Ah, hey there, little guy. Uh, could you give me your father, please? I see, he's not in. Uh, may I speak to your mom, then? Uh, I see, she's out as well. Okay, uh, does that mean that you're uh, home alone? No, is there an adult in the house? Ah, your babysitter. Okay, uh, may I speak to her? Yes, hello, this is Gary Reynolds of Pilgrim Publishing. Uh, no, not Penguin. P-I-L-G-R-I-M. <laughs> right. Uh, I wanted to speak to Mr. Smith about a new cookbook series that we're preparing. No, 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 you've misunderstood. No, I, I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't sell encyclopedias. No, listen, I work in a publishing house, and Mr. Smith is one of our authors. Oh, hey, wait, don't hang up. Hey, could, could you... Oh, hello? Well... Let's try someone else, Mr. Fox. Good morning, this is Gary Reynolds of Pilgrim Publishing at Answering Machine. Great. Yes, good morning, this is a message for Mr. Fox. Uh, I'm Gary Reynolds of Pilgrim Publishing. And I was interested in finding out if you would like to participate in a new cookbook series that we are publishing soon. You can contact me at your earliest convenience, and you can reach me at the number 786-8776. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Well, it seems like today is just not my lucky day. the answer phone. Alice! Hello, it's Anne. I need to speak to you urgently. Please call me as soon as you get this message. I've got lots of news to tell you about Peter and Sharon. I imagine you're interested. Anyway, um, no news for now. Mm. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Peter telephoned to say that he'd called Sharon about Japan, and do you know what she said? I'm not going to tell you. Call me and you'll find out. Okay, bye. Speak to you soon. Oh, uh, you can reach me at the office. Bye, bye. Pilgrim Publishing, good morning. Who is this? Yes, this is Mr. Stevens' office. With whom am I speaking? Oh, good morning, Mr. Emerson. If I'm not mistaken, you're the head of Montex Topography. This is Rachel Gordon, Mr. Stevens' assistant. It's a pleasure to meet you. On the phone. No, I'm sorry. Mr. Stevens isn't in at the moment. He just left. Yes, I know it's four o'clock. No, unfortunately, he was called away unexpectedly. Would you care to speak with me? <laughs> no, don't worry. There are no secrets between Mr. Stevens and myself. Yes, he telephoned to find out if you had already begun work on our order. 
And I think he also wanted to know about the means of delivery. Uh-huh. Fine. Ah, Mr. Stevens will be pleased. Yes, uh, I've taken note of everything. In any case, I'll have him call you tomorrow morning. When will you be in? At 10. Okay. Fine. Goodbye, Mr. Emerson. I look forward to meeting you in person. Hello? No, I'm sorry. She's not here right now. Um, who's this? Alice! This is Gary. Right, the Joker. <laughs> Which, by the way, was Anne's idea. No, I didn't want to go along, but uh, she insisted. <laughs> no, I, I don't know where she's gone. Perhaps to make some photocopies. Would you like to leave a message? Uh-huh. Okay, I'll tell her to ring you as soon as she returns. Are you at home? No, your cell phone. Okay, all right, bye. Oh, hey, hey, Alice. Um, you know, uh, you seem like a really nice girl, even if uh, we don't know each other. Um, may I ask you something? Oh, no, it's just that, um, well, would you like to have dinner with me tonight? But uh, please, don't say anything to Anne. She might get angry. No, no, I, I know you two are such good friends. You live together. Okay, okay, don't get worked up. L listen, I was just joking. <laughs> all right, all right, bye, Alice, no, bye. What a hothead. You really can't say anything to her. Such a pity. I would have liked to take her out. She is very nice. Fine. Now let's look at that language that we use, especially when we have problems on the phone. And to do this, let's use the screen, okay? Now the first thing is problems with understanding. Often when you speak to native language speakers, there are problems. So you have to try and control the situation. Let's see what phrases you can use. Well, the first thing is you can say, could you repeat that, please? You notice we say, could you repeat that? Not could you repeat, please, but could you repeat that, please? That's one thing. Another thing, if they're speaking too softly, you could say, could you speak up, please? Could you speak up, please? Another thing, they're talking too fast, too fast. So you say, could you speak more slowly, please? Could you speak more slowly, please? And then if you didn't, quite hear it, you can say, uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. I didn't catch that. All right, so that's problems with understanding. Now, problems with spelling. Sometimes people say their name and you can't really understand the name. So you can ask them this. Uh, excuse me, could you spell your name, please? They say, yeah, J-O-H- N. Now, it's useful if you repeat what they say just to check understanding. So you can say, uh huh, so that's J O H N, okay? Or you can say, I repeat that J O H N. All right, so problems with spelling. The next thing is problems with these. Now, since the introduction of these, we have new language which we use on the telephone. Things can happen. For example, you could be on the phone and it's, ah, ah. You say, the reception's bad, okay? The reception's bad. Now, if you're listening, maybe the other person sounds like this. You say, you're breaking up, you're breaking up. I'll call you back. You're breaking up. The voice is eh, 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 eh. Okay? 
Uh, you can also say, mm, the line's bad. The line's bad. I'll call you back. Okay? Now, another thing is the battery. Sometimes you can see the battery. So you can say, uh, my battery's running low. My battery's running low. Running low. Another thing is money. You need money to make this work. Sometimes you can see that you don't have much credit. You can warn the person and you say, look, my battery's running low and I'm running out of credit. I'm running out of credit. I'll call you back later, okay? And then sometimes, for an example, if you're on a train, and you're traveling in a mountainous area, sometimes you go through tunnels and the chances are this will happen. So you can say, uh, look, if we're cut off, I'll call you back. If we're cut off, I'll call you back. All right, so typical problems with mobile telephones. Now, sometimes you have problems when you're trying to connect people. You call, you want to speak to somebody, there are problems reaching that person. So, you can hear, I'm sorry, there's no reply. Or, I'm sorry, the line's engaged at the moment. Or, Mr. John's on the other line. Or, she's out of the office. Or, he isn't in at the moment. Or, he's just left. He's being called away unexpectedly. All right, so those are typical things that happen when you're trying to connect. And another thing is the answering machines. Now, sometimes you will call somebody and you'll hear a message and you have to leave a message. Now, a typical message from America could be, you have reached 700423, please leave a message after the tone. In Britain, you would hear, this is 700423. This is the answering machine of James Smith, for example. Please leave a message after the beep. So, you do that. You leave your name, the company, the time you called, give your message, and then say goodbye. All right, so that's some more language for you to help you in particular when you have problems on the telephone or when you have to leave messages. All right, well, that's the end of this lesson and I'll see you again in the next one. Bye. Victoria Lee, good morning. Do you remember me? Yes, certainly. And to what do I owe the pleasure of your unexpected visit? Beautiful office. My compliments. You've certainly come a long way, haven't you? Well, I can't complain. If you don't mind, I've got quite a lot to do. You didn't feel that way a year ago when we first met. Listen, Mrs Baker, that was a very difficult period for me. I wasn't happy with my job and... Don't worry, Lee. I'm not here to visit the past but rather to talk about the future. What? I've recently heard quite a bit about you. I know that you've done great things to improve the bottom line of Spectra. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here today. I'd like you to come and work for us. Thank you, Mrs Baker, but... Just a moment, Lee. Let me have my say. If you came to work for us, you'd not only have the opportunity to work for a successful company, but you'd also have a brilliant career with full satisfaction ahead of you. I'm flattered, but as I said, I'm very pleased with my present employment. If I were to propose a position as business development manager, would you consider my offer? Mrs Baker, please. If I were to come and work for you, I'd be doing my company a disservice. Just think it over, Lee. If you accept, you'll get a much higher salary than your current one. Of course, I forgot to mention the company car and mobile phone, not to mention an impressive percentage of sales. That's enough, Mrs Baker. Your offer is very tempting, and if I were free, I would certainly accept. However, things have changed greatly. I am very satisfied with my job here. 
Mrs. Lee, I brought you this brochure. I was just, uh... Fine, I'll leave. Mrs. Lee, just think about what I said. I'll be in touch. Have you got a moment? I just have to show you a few things. Alice, how many times have I told you to call before you come and visit me at the office? If my boss finds out, I'll be in trouble. Oh, yes, I know. You're right. I'm sorry. Anyway, you are on your coffee break. And I just need some advice. I'm going out with Philip tonight. You know, the handsome guy I met at the library last week. Oh, I told you about him, didn't I? Uh, I don't know, Alice. I've lost count. Every week there's a different guy. And what's so important about him that you couldn't wait to see me? What if I wear this tonight? It's nice. Red suits you. Really? Mm. Mm. But if I wear this, I'll have to find the right black shawl. By the way, can you lend me the one you bought last Saturday? Alice, it's brand new. I haven't even worn it yet. Come on, Anne. I told you that this date is really important to me. Okay. What if I wore this one? Mm, that's pretty too. Mm, yes, but if I wear this one, it would go better with your blue hat. Could you lend it to me? Oh, please, Anne. Oh, Alice, no, not that one. It was a present from my sister. Oh. I'm very attached to it. Oh, please, Anne. Come on, help me, please. Okay, okay. It's impossible to put you out of anything anyway. But if I'd known you were going to borrow my entire wardrobe, I would have immediately told you I was very busy. Thanks, Anne. You're the best. Yeah. Okay, I'm going now. Um, by the way, what would you say if I told you I had broken your camera? You'd done what? Oh, come on, Anne. I'm joking. Oh, I think work is making you just a little bit too nervous. Bye! So now let's talk about the conditionals in English, the first and the second. Now, they're interesting because there's a difference in meaning between the first and the second, and also a difference in grammar. The first one we use in situations which are really possible, but the second conditional we use in situations which are more improbable. And I want to look at some examples of that now. You imagine that you work for um, a large insurance company and you have to explain some situations to a client. Obviously, you're trying to sell the idea of them having an insurance policy. Let's look at the board and look at some of the situations. Now, in the first situation, an accident. Now, if you have an accident and you don't have insurance cover, what happens? If you have an accident, you won't be covered for legal expenses. Now, that's a problem. The first conditional is grammatically formed like this, if plus the present tense and then the future will or won't in the negative. Let's look at another example. You see, number two is accident stop work. So the first conditional sentence would be, if you have an accident, you'll, that's the future, you'll have to stop work. Look at the third example. If you stop work, you'll have no protection for the family. The fourth example, if you go to hospital, there'll be no cover for hospital fees. 
So you see, you have a situation and then the consequence. The last example, let's change the situation, no longer an accident, but still related to insurance. If you have a house fire, you'll have no cover for lost items. So here we see a situation and the consequence. Okay, so we use, the, these are real possibilities. We use the first conditional. Now let's look at the second conditional. Now, I want to give you some examples and ask you the question, what would you do if? And these are situations that maybe you will never find yourself in. They're a bit improbable, but you like to hypothesize about them. So we use the second conditional. I ask you, what would you do if your company offered you a job in China for five years? And you think, my God, China for five years, interesting. Well, I'd accept it. I would accept it. Now, the grammatical form of the second conditional is if followed by the past tense, followed by would and the conditional. All right, let me ask you another question. What would you do if a Japanese businessman gave you his business card like this? What would you do? Well, if a businessman, a Japanese businessman, gave me his business card like this, I would accept it with two hands and bow a little. Then I would read it carefully and put it in a special place to show respect. Okay, what would you do? I would do that. Okay, next one. Number three, what would you do if you lost all your money and all your credit cards? What would you do? I would phone the bank immediately if I lost, simple past, if I lost all my money and credit cards, wouldn't you? Last one, what would you do if you had a first meeting with an Arab businessman? With an Arab businessman, what would you do? Well, I wouldn't talk business until he decided to talk business himself. I would let him decide to open business conversations. All right? So there are some examples of the first and the second conditional forms in English, used a little bit in the business context. All right? So that's all for now, and I'll see you again in the next lesson. Yes. Yes, Mr. Jones. The collection is divided into thematic volumes. Your volume will be the first uh, dealing with starters. That's right. Yes, recipes should be written clearly and precisely. Well, I'm not sure I agree with you there. Ingredients should be written separately, directly under the title of each dish. Okay. I'll expect your first instalment next week, then. All right. Goodbye, Mr. Jones. Goodbye. Uh, excuse me, Gary. Has Mr. Bradford got in touch yet? <laughs> Gary? Hello? I asked you a question. Could you answer, please? Uh... <coughs> What's up, Ben? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm writing the contracts to send out to the authors. Have you spoken to Mr. Bradford yet? Uh, no. Could you give him a call? I'm really very busy at the moment. Okay. Could you at least tell me where you are with him? Has he sent us the materials? Gary? <laughs> Hello, Gary! Uh, what? Please, can you tell me what is so entertaining about drawing up contracts? Why? Because you're glued to your computer and you keep laughing like a fool. Uh, I'm just in a good mood today. Come on, Gary. I'm not stupid. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, you've caught me out. I'm chatting. 
It's great fun. Would you like to give it a try? No, thank you very much. And you shouldn't be chatting at work anyway. Mr. Stevens might notice. Now, why would he? If he walks in the door, I'll just close the window and continue typing up the contracts. Anne, relax. Let's chat a bit together. No, I'm afraid I can't. Somebody needs to work around here. Now, could you explain how I should proceed with this? You spoke to Mr. Bradford, so could you give me some details on your agreement? Uh, yes, he should have sent some materials in two days ago, but we still haven't received anything yet. Uh, give him a call and see where he's at with those. Hello, Mr. Bradford. This is Anne Baxter from Pilgrim Publishing. Hello. Um, we are still waiting for the materials you should have sent us two days ago. I just wanted to know if you were having problem. Well, what does the index have to do with it? I'm afraid I don't understand. No, it's just I wasn't aware that... No, I don't think... What, could, could you just hold on a second? Hey, Mark, this is Gary. No, 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 don't worry. Everything's just fine. Anne uh, just didn't know. <laughs> have you finished the index, then? Okay, great. Uh, we'll expect your email, then. Okay. Bye, Mark. I hate you, Gary. If you spent a little time filling me in instead of chatting on your computer, I might just know what's going on around here. What? Oh! Mrs. Lee, excuse me for disturbing, but I need to speak to you for a moment. You're not disturbing, Mr. Chang. What can I do for you? Perhaps it's none of my business, but considering the importance of the deal for you and your company, I want to be absolutely sure that everything goes smoothly and that no ugly surprises are around the corner. I don't understand, Mr. Chang. What are you getting at? You see, Victoria, I value highly and trust in you but I don't like people going behind my back. What are you insinuating, Mr. Chang? Victoria, I know very well the woman who visited you in your office yesterday, Mrs. Baker, Human Resources Director for Play, the world's largest sporting goods chain. And? Mrs. Baker is well known as a headhunter. You know, those personnel managers who rob other companies of their own talents uh, to employ for their own companies. So tell me, Victoria, what did Mrs. Baker want from you? You're right. Mrs. Baker made me a very interesting offer, but I certainly have no intention of accepting. Are you quite sure, Victoria? Look, Mr. Chang, I had an interview with Mrs. Baker last year. At the time, I was working for Spectre, but I was very unhappy. I had been hired to work in the business office and had expected more important assignments. But unfortunately, my work was very monotonous and boring, nothing that met my expectations. So I sent a CV to play, they contacted me for an interview, but there weren't any positions open at the time. Therefore, I stayed at Spectre. And there's another thing, Mr. Chang. I have a dream. I've always wanted to work in a publishing house ever since I was a teenager. And that's also why I wanted to leave this job. Numbers just don't go with my creativity. And uh, what about now, Victoria? Do you still doubt about your job? And uh, what about your expectations? Well, now things are different. I've taken on a role with more responsibilities, and I'm working on important projects like this one. It's been a double victory for me. Not many women have such prestigious positions, and I'm quite proud of that. I finally have the chance to demonstrate all my abilities, and I have no intention to renounce that. You have to believe me, Mr. Chang. I have no intention whatsoever of betraying my company. I believe you, Victoria. I certainly appreciate your sincerity. You're quite a capable young woman. And I'm certainly very pleased to have solved this little misunderstanding.
Do you remember how Anne said in the first scene, I don't agree? Now, in English, we say, I don't agree. We don't say, I'm not agree, as in many other languages. I don't agree. That's one way of disagreeing. And do you remember how Victoria said in the second scene, she said, I don't understand what you're getting at. Now, that's one way of asking for clarification. So, I'd like to look at this language with you now. Now, if I say something like this, I, I say, let's look at the screen. I say, I think we should increase our investment in management training. Now, this is something I could say in a meeting. I think we should increase our investment in management training. Now, sometimes after saying something like that, you want to explain it a little bit more. And there are phrases we can use in order to do further explanation. For example, I could say, what I'm trying to say is, I don't think we spend enough money on training. So, what I'm trying to say is... Now, another possibility is, what I mean is... And one more is, the point I'm making is... So, it becomes, I think we should invest more money in management training. The point I'm making is our company just doesn't do enough training. All right, so that's explaining a point. Now, what about clarifying? I say that to somebody, and then I want to check that they've understood. So I could say, is that clear? Is that clear? Or um, do you understand what I mean? Do you understand what I mean? Then, in the audience or in the meeting, if they're not quite sure, they can ask you for clarification. And different ways of asking clarification are these. For example, you could say, I don't quite follow you. I don't quite follow you. Follow the verb follow. One possibility. Or, well, what exactly do you mean? What exactly do you mean? Or, I don't see what you mean. Notice that we use also verbs of sight. I don't see what you mean. Or could I have some more details? Could I have some more details? Or what are you getting at? Now that's uh, slightly more complicated. Get at means what are you suggesting? What are you insinuating? All right, so these are ways of asking for clarification. Now, very often in a meeting, you want to be able to agree or to disagree. Now, ways of agreeing, I say, for example, I think we should invest more in management training. And you say, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. Notice we don't say, I am agree with you, but I agree with you. You can say, yep, yeah, I see what you mean. You can say, I see your point. I see your point. And you can say also, yes, I agree up to point, which means not completely, but mostly yes. Now, maybe you want to do the opposite. So I say, I think we should invest more in management training. And you disagree. You can say, hmm, yeah, I see your point, but I think we should invest more in marketing. Or you can say, I'm afraid I can't agree with you. I can't agree with you. Or you could say, are you sure about that? Which is more indirect, all right? Then the other thing is giving an opinion. Giving an opinion, well, different ways of doing that are number one. In my view, you notice in my view, we're using verbs of sight, that's interesting, yeah? In my view, I think we should invest more money. Or you could ask a question. Don't you think we should invest more money in training? Or you could say, I think it would be a good idea to invest more. So that's you giving your opinion, your idea. Then obviously it's important to create an atmosphere of sharing ideas, so you want to ask other people about their opinions. So you could say, for example, what do you reckon? 
Reckon is another verb we use in English for think. What do you reckon? Or what do you think about that? What do you think about that? What's your opinion? All right, so these are very important things. It's explaining, clarifying, agreeing, disagreeing, giving opinions, asking opinions. Very important. You use the language every day. All right, so that's the language for this lesson, and I look forward to seeing you in the next. Bye. Hello, and welcome back to Business Talk. Hi there. Well, today we're going to talk about giving good presentations in English. Yes, giving a presentation can be a frightening prospect, but if you understand the psychology behind the business skill, it really is quite simple. Like most business skills, it's all about communication and using the right kind of language in an effective way, right? That's right. But I still think it's an important moment. Obviously, you want to make a good impression, and the fear of boring your listeners can make you very nervous. Well, in the Anglo-Saxon world, making a good impression usually means demonstrating your ability in teamwork, that you're a good member to have on the team. Teamwork is all about organization, and it implies everyone working together. Therefore, the language you use should involve everyone. And of course, you don't want to bore or lose anyone along the way, so keep it simple. Yes. Organization, language, and simplicity are three very important factors when planning a presentation. First, organize what you want to say. And is there some kind of winning structure for a good presentation? Definitely. You should always start with a personal introduction, then the subject of your presentation and its purpose. It's a good idea to briefly outline the main points of the presentation and then talk about each point in more detail. At the end, give a short summary of what you've said before your conclusion, and there you go. You make it sound so simple. Well, the aim of this structure is, in fact, to simplify your task. And remember, the number one rule for giving a good presentation in English is KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it short and simple. How about giving an example of a presentation? Okay, well, we don't really have time for a whole presentation, but I'll give you an example of the kind of language and structure I mean. Good morning. I'm Eric Brown. And I'm in charge of quality control here at the plant. This morning, I'd like to talk about a problem we had last week. My aim is to stop this problem happening again. First, I'm going to give you some background information. Then I'll fill you in on the details. And finally, we'll look at some possible solutions. So, first of all, let's look at the background. And here, Eric would give some background information about the problem, so everyone has a clear picture. Now we're going to try to understand exactly what happened last week. Here, Eric would talk about the problem we had last week. And finally, why don't we have a look at some possible solutions? At which point, Eric would talk about the various solutions to the problem in turn, before saying... Let me sum up. Where Eric would briefly summarize the different points he's made during the presentation and move on to the conclusion, starting... So... Now, shall we try to draw some conclusions? Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. That was very precise and to the point. Now, it's difficult to remember everything you want to say unless you learn it all by heart, especially if you're nervous, so it's a good idea to have some notes with you. Of course, you shouldn't read the whole presentation. That could get quite boring, but... You do want to get off to a good start, so perhaps writing your introduction word for word is advisable. And then just have the opening sentences of each part of the presentation so you have an outline to follow. Yes, in case you get lost, you can easily get back on track. That's right, and speak slowly and clearly. Obviously try to use emphasis and pauses to highlight the important points. So, KISS is the key to a good presentation. Keep it short and simple. And the three fundamental aspects to keep in mind are organization, language, and simplicity. Today, most people use PowerPoint to deliver their presentations. We can't talk about how to use PowerPoint now. Remember to get the language right, and your PowerPoint presentation will be fine. Good advice. Our time's up, so I'm afraid we have to say goodbye. See you soon. Bye-bye.
Let's look more closely at Eric's presentation and those three important factors to bear in mind when planning a presentation. Organisation, language and simplicity. So, the first thing to do is organise what you want to say and give your presentation a clear structure. Let's look at a basic outline for a presentation. Start with a brief personal introduction so everyone knows who you are. Then introduce the subject and purpose of your presentation. Briefly outline the main points so everyone knows what you will be talking about and then treat each point in order. It's a good idea to give a short summary of all the points at the end. And finally, a conclusion to close your presentation. Personal introduction. Introduce subject and purpose. Outline the main points. Point one, point two, point three. Summary, conclusion. And what about the language? Remember, KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it short and simple. Simplicity is essential in every aspect of the presentation, in its organisation and the language we use. Short, well-structured sentences that mark the beginning of each part of the presentation are helpful to keep you on track and keep your listeners' attention. Did you notice in Eric's presentation, he marked the start of each new section of the presentation very clearly? Let's look at the language he used and how each point corresponds to the outline we've just seen. I'd like to talk about a problem we had last week. My aim is to stop this problem happening again. First, I'm going to give you some background information. Then I'll fill you in on the details. And finally, we'll look at some possible solutions. So first of all, let's look at the background. Now we're going to try to understand exactly what happened last week. And finally, why don't we have a look at some possible solutions? Let me sum up. So now shall we try to draw some conclusions? Notice how the beginning of each section is clearly marked. And remember, team spirit is important. As with brainstorming, it's important that everyone listening feels part of a team. So avoid using I too much because it detaches you, the speaker, from the group. Try to find other ways of structuring your ideas so that everyone feels included.